Hi, Charles. Hey, Nicolette. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you so much for saying yes to be interviewed today. Um, for those listening, I'd like to, and also to you, Charles, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Nicolette. I am the creator for the podcast titled Hero Wordless. Read that again. The juxtaposition of your very soul. Yes. I would like to say thank you for finally we're here. We had to reschedule a few times, but now we're here. Thanks mm-hmm. to technology. Um, I'd like to read a bit of your introduction for our listeners today, and then we can get right into our conversation. So, hey, everyone, we have Charles Gernser. Great. <laughs> With Perfect. us here. Mr. Gernser is a partner at Relentless Venture Studio, focused on sales initiatives, new business, acquisitions, and exits. He is also founder of a number of current Relentless portfolio companies, including linkvanow.com, which is a full-service managed LinkedIn lead generation system, which allows its clients to focus on opportunity creation and closes whilst its virtual assistant team focuses on running the system and harvesting the leads themselves. It is a reasonably priced full-service option that has seen tremendous growth in adoption since it was launched in 2022. His background includes serving as chief revenue officer and executive general manager at SMS Masterminds, contributing to its successful sale to a major private equity group. Mr. Karenser graduated cum laude from the Anderson School of Business at the University of California, Riverside. A native of Bronx, New York, he lives in San, San Luis Obispo, California with his wife and two daughters. Yes. Wow. <laughs> welcome, Charles. Welcome. <laughs> That's me in a nutshell. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So Charles, tell us, first off, what was it like growing up as Charles Gerenser? Oh, well, first of all, thank you again, Nicolette, for having me. But uh, the last name, you know, it's kind of funny because, I mean, you know, it's not the most difficult last name to pronounce. I've seen many more with more um, consonants and more syllables. But because my name has a C and an S, people yeah. really pick it up and it's funny the other day, one of my daughters was receiving an award, you know, here in town <laughs> for community service. And the woman came up to us and who's presenting the award before the audience came in. She says, I want to get it right. Pronounce your last name for me. And I said, here it is. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay, great. And then the they get into the promotion and then my daughter walks up and she says the name and she pauses and then <laughs> totally butchers it. And so growing up, as Charles Gerenser, I was always, you know, this little bit of a of a of a lump in my throat when the the teacher would say my name for the first time in classes because they would say Charles and then they would pause and say say nothing and then I would just say present, you know, I know that's me, yeah. So that's one of the things that came full circle for me just the other day because my daughter got an award. So you know, that's one thing. That's one thing. But I grew up, uh, I was born in New York, but my, my folks moved out to the Western U.S. in California when I was a baby. So pretty much a California guy. Um, you know, I grew up in a part of the city in, in the Los Angeles area that was, you know, very much like a lower middle class um, neighborhood, not, nothing too fancy. Um, you know, a, a good home, you know, good parents, good schools. So I had a lot of opportunities present themselves even at a very young age um, where my interests in, in business uh, started at a very early age. Um, and so I can really thank my, my, my earliest, uh, you know, kind of upbringing for that. My parents encouraged me to be industrious and entrepreneurial. So I did a number of things from you know, mowing lawns to, uh, I had, I had my first mobile business. It was a mobile lemonade stand that I built on the wheels cart. so that I could <laughs> roll it around right. from corner to corner, wherever the best opportunity was. And I was doing that at eight years old. So wow. I had some great ideas as a, as a kid and, and I was able to, uh, to get into business for myself. And, you know, that became my earliest, um, you know, my earliest inclinations in business and then had the fortunate opportunity to go to business school and uh, and then get get right into business um, right out of right out of uh, college 
you know, I've, I've been doing that now for the better part of, of now nearly three decades. Wow, wow, wow. Well, I'd like to unpack the journey. And then we're going to do that once we get into some of the questions. So mm-hmm. um, but I want to go back to the part where there is a there is a thing here. You made a sale to a major private group, private equity group. So mm-hmm. how how do you start the process of acquiring a business or selling a business? Is it mm-hmm. the same or different? Okay. So when you're on the buying side, mm-hmm. I mean, the world is your oyster. You know, you can, there are a number of uh, really well curated marketplace sites that you can begin your search um, for businesses and whether it's a technology business you want to acquire, or maybe you want to acquire a brick and mortar business. Uh, you know, there are a number of, of sites here domestically in the U.S., also globally, that one can go and search out a business. If, if you're selling a business, if you're on the exit side, you know, it's, it's really important that your business translates to the outside world. And what I'm saying there is it's not just we make widgets, we make them well, we sell a lot of them. Your internal organization, your SOPs, your standard operating procedures may make sense to you, but when you are looking to exit your business, it has to make sense to the buyer. And so oftentimes a lot of um, entrepreneurs who seek to sell their business wind up failing because too much of their business is them and not Ooh. enough the SOPs and the processes around the business. Okay. Uh, and so when you're building the business, think about universality. Oh, it can't just make sense to you. It has to make sense to anybody who mm-hmm. might look at and evaluate this business between your accounting and finance process policies or internal sales organization, your customer support. It has to be, um, you know, simple uh, and not loaded with a lot of idiosyncrasies and, um, you know, dogmatic like acronyms that only make sense to you. You know, you want to make it so that anybody could come in and evaluate your business and say, this is a good business. I want, I want to buy it. So when you're exiting the business, the beginning of that process is to take an objective view of the business and that's that can be tough i think for a lot of entrepreneurs so it's usually pretty helpful to consider hiring a business broker somebody mm-hmm. who will um you know work on a performance basis so they only get paid when you sell the business similar to like a real estate agent right um, that broker oftentimes will be able to give you that um objective feedback is your business tidy is it clear does it make sense to the potential buyer because if it doesn't then you're going to be in a di- it's going to be a difficult position either you will not attract qualified buyers because they won't understand how how your business is organized mm-hmm. or you get someone who's excited at the beginning and then they get into due diligence and they can't understand anything so they drop out mm-hmm. or and this sometimes is 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 the last potential um, friction, they want to buy your business, they acquire your business, and then they request of you a protracted transfer services agreement where you are now obligated to work for the new buyer for a period of time so that things- Transitionary period so that- Yeah, uh, they remain the continuity Mm -hmm. of operation. And so the more objectively tidy the business can be, the less those things will happen. And then instead of like, having a six month commitment to the new buyer, maybe it's a few weeks or one month. And, and, and that's the position you want to be in when you're exiting the business. Now, I have a question more mm-hmm. for me, because let's say, okay, about to join, uh, about to get into the coaching space. Oh, th- also, this is for the listeners listening. So let's say if they're starting, if they have an end goal of selling their business, right? If somebody out there right now, as they're listening to this, with that end goal of selling, what should they do right from the get-go? Right. So right from the get-go, there should Mm -hmm. be intense documentation of all of your internal processes. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's say you, you sell a product. I mean, you want it very well. Oh, let's say a service. What about a service? A service. 
Yeah. yeah. So even being a service, you want to make sure that your product is well defined. So you have a very clear articulation of that, whether it's in a an index or some type of physical listing that might be a guide to the service. You want to be, that to be clearly articulated so that there's there's no chance for misinterpretation on the part of your customers of what it exactly it is you're going to deliver. So for instance, we meant you mentioned my business uh, linked VA now. Yeah. Every one of our customers is governed by a very simple two-page contract. And the right. contract delineates all the deliverables. So there's mm. nothing that's vague. It's not did I get it? Did I not get it? It's in the contract. So it's mm. it's very clear. Oftentimes, particularly in the coaching vertical, you yeah. know, the end result can be a bit very nebulous. subjective. You know, what's, yeah. my, what's my net result? And so mm. in that case, I would probably advocate that it's all about time. You know, mm. you we are engaged for X amount of time, 30 days, 90 days, whatever the period may be. And mm. then in, in the case of coaching, because it might vary from client to client, have your clients articulate what they expect out of that period of time in writing to you agree or disagree with the ability to deliver those goals, once you have consensus, that goes in the contract. Right. So it's time and specific deliverables, milestone, action items that are actually delivered. Um, that way, when, it, when and if the relationship ends, because it will, the day you lose a customer is the day you sign a customer. That's just the nature of being in business where you have customers. Um, you want an orderly exit, or, or you want customers leaving you saying, you know, I need to break it off for now, but I'm going to come back. I mean, that's the general attitude you want anytime an engagement ends. You don't want it to be adversarial or people feeling they didn't get their, you know, their return on investment. So I think it's very important to govern those relationships with your customers, particularly in the service arena, with a very clear articulation in the form of a contract in terms mm -hmm. of who does what and 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 what they are responsible for in terms of each party mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's the simplest way if it's if it's if you're signing up coach uh, if you're signing up clients and you are just you're a new business then get the contracts in order get the get the documentation and then file it away if and when that goal changes if you want to stay in that business then stay if you want to sell it, then it's easy for, for the new buyer to take over and carry on your yeah. legacy or their legacy. When you sell a business, if you have revenue coming into your business, yeah, no matter how uh, reliable it is, if you mm -hmm. do not have contracts, mm -hmm. uh, the absence of written contracts or purchase orders uh, is a serious liability. And typically will drive the sale price of your business down. Lower. Mm -hmm. So the more documentation you have of that revenue, the, how assured is that revenue moving mm -hmm. forward month to month? It's very important in terms of your exit multiple. Everything is on handshakes. Yeah. You know, that's very difficult to exit a business like that because what is the buyer buying? Exactly. And yeah. then also the bank statements, right? Well, yes, yeah. the money coming in. <laughs> the bank statements matter. Yeah. And when you get to due diligence, they're going to look at your, you know, your accounting uh, reports and they're going to do a forensic analysis of your bank statements to see that the money is as it has been stated in your, in your bank, rec sure. your bank when they're reconciled mm -hmm. against your sales reports. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. All right. I think we did touch a little bit about the next about the, the the gist of the next question however it's good to um, lay it out here again what are the common pitfalls when people try to acquire and or sell business yeah the, i think the most common pitfalls as we've stated here is that there's a lack of clarity in the documentation like say for example let's say you have 50 customers and you have a handful of customers who pay generally pay you late Right. Maybe they're not an automatic bill that you have to chase them around a little bit. But but what are your actual policies as it relates to past due accounts? Just as a for example, mm -hmm. if you don't have that clearly articulated, let's say 
invoices are due every month by the third of the month. Then you need to have the next step. If an invoice is, is not paid by the 10th, then an email goes out and warns them that their account may be suspended. If it's not paid by the 15th, it's suspended. No more work happens. And if it's not paid by the following third, then the account is canceled. You know, mm -hmm. this is just, I'm just sort of hypothesizing like this might be the way you do it, but if it's not written out in in a clear you know, SOP, uh, this case for past due accounts, you know, you want to have that all very well organized. Now, many um, merchant processing platforms such as Square or Stripe, both very oh, popular yeah. kind of globally, they have a lot of those tools built into their system in terms of you set the business rules and then you can do an output like a narrative output of what those rules are. But it's also mm -hmm. I think, just as easy to have just a, you know, a Google Doc where all the, all the processes are listed. You know, I would do both. Mm -hmm. Revenue recognition. That's another important thing. So let's say you have a customer, you're a coach, and you charge 3000 US a month for your services. And you have a customer come in and say, okay, I want to hire you for six months, but I want a deal. I'll pay you 10,000 US, but I want that for the six months. You decide, mm -hmm. okay, I'm willing to do that. So you take the 10,000 in, but how have you recognized that revenue? Did you pull it all in one month and just recognize the revenue in a single month? But mm -hmm. you're delivering or services for six months? <laughs> yeah. You actually have to apply revenue recognition rules to that money. Mm -hmm. You can take the 10,000, but you can only take a sixth of it each month in revenue recognition. So when your buyer looks at your books, you don't want to see one giant you know, 10,000 one month and nothing the rest. You want to smooth mm. the revenue out. And so that's a common mistake on the part of solopreneurs, smaller business owners is they, they don't recognize the revenue accurately. So their mm. numbers are not you know, in, in, in alignment with what the business is actually doing. Because if you're having to put time into a customer, but you have no revenue that month, that's, that's a bad position to be in. So you yeah. want to always have it true up with the mm -hmm. actual costs that are being incurred relative to that uh, deliverable, that, that particular project. Mm. Wow. 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 Thank you, Charles. That, that gave me such valuable insights because I wanted to go in the space of coaching. Now, I never thought that it was actually possible that I had to be at Apple or Google standard market cap to have, you know... <laughs> To to sell it out, and it's actually possible. Sure, sure. There, it's there, actually there are, possible. There are a number of so a couple wow. of the websites I want to mention. Um, mm -hmm. One, it, it's more popular here in the U.S. is called Biz Buy Sell, and on that site there are about seventy five thousand businesses for sale, and it's everything from major franchise brands that mm -hmm. you know, like buy a McDonald's. You know, I mean, it's there. Right. You know, like a turnkey business. Yeah, yeah. All the way down to like a one man, you know, marketing co company, you know, really? doing around 100K in revenue and looking to exit. So Biz by Sell is a good website to browse businesses for sale. Um, there's another one with a little bit more sophisticated upstream businesses. So these are going to be more like million dollar and up. Mm -hmm. And that's a website called Axial, A-X-I-A-L. So these are sites that one can look You're at. You're giving me so many. So it's <laughs> Ax Biz by Sale, Axial. Yeah. Okay. And then Axial. Okay. And these two sites, you can just go on there as a potential buyer and just browse. And that's a good way as a seller to educate yourself on what, what does my business seem to look like. And, exactly. You know, you kind of, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just look at somebody else's wheel. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I love it. Revenue recognition, the common pitfalls, and then the SOPs, documentation. Mm -hmm. Huge. Okay. I, I, I used to work in a nine to five and, and big, big organizations that have all of this. But then when you pull yourself out of the system and you start your own, you kind of think always you switch it back to, okay, this is a one man show. And then you don't, you won't have all the time to figure it out because you're thinking about your customer, you're thinking about your strategy, thinking about your marketing, and then the aftercare. And then often the documentation gets put in the back burner. 100%. But, yeah. But if this is, I mean, so 
you have to have the trajectory of where you're going. Are you going to stay in business or you maybe you're going to look out to sell it. So get it right from the get go. Maybe not 100 percent because people will be learning as they go. Yes. But at least at least. Yeah. I guess somehow you'll fall you'll fall short. Let's say suddenly you get a, a sudden influx of customers and then, oh, my God. I need a team. That's true. Yeah. And you know, you, the cus you want the customer to come first. So if a customer is blowing yeah. up the cell phone and needs this, needs that, I mean, you want to, you want to come through for your customer. And so that's right. you'll forget to do the bank reconciliation that month. <laughs> you know, yeah. Customers. And that's all, that's understandable. But yes, when you start to scale the company, you should have part-time bookkeeper. You should have mm -hmm. part-time, you know, a CPA who does your, you know, tax, you know, tax um, arrangements and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you have to bring those people in. You can't do all that yourself, even if, yeah. even if you just have a handful of clients. I mean, you start to become, you know, more a bit more complex. And if you have yes. any designs on exiting the business, mm. you're going to need, you're going to need your business in a state that it can't just be you saying this, this is it. These are the numbers. Typically, your buyer is going to yeah. want to see a quality of earnings report. And that's going to be a third party who says, yes, I testify that the earnings an audit, are an audit firm. Audited, audited, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Audited. Yeah. 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 But now that this brings us to the next question. So what does a virtual assistant do? <laughs> what types of services can they provide? And I guess this fits in just nicely. Yeah. So... <laughs> So I have a company and so we have a venture studio out here in California. So we have a number of companies in our portfolio, but one in particular is exciting because it focuses on LinkedIn, which is a, you know, massively important business network. And so in the name of that business, it's linked VA now VA standing for virtual assistant. So it's not AI. In case of my business, it's not some, you know, algorithm. It is an actual person, a, a member of our team that is account manages on your behalf. They're just not in the same room as you. So they're virtual like you and I are having this virtual conversation. It's just, you know, they might be in California or New Jersey or Kuala Lumpur. I mean, they could be mm -hmm. anywhere, really, right? So yeah. um, that's the VA part of it. Uh, probably a better word or a better phrase is remote assistant because, mm -hmm. you know, they're just not, um, you know, they're not showing up at your office every day to turn, turn in a report to you. So, so that's the VA part of that particular business for us. And that's, that's what VA means to me. And, and this concept of virtual really came full force in 2020, of course, with the pandemic. I mean, my entire business, 60 employees had to go remote and, and, and ostensibly virtual. So all of my meetings then and up to now are like this. <laughs> yeah. I'll have one of my portfolio company meeting at eight o'clock in the morning and there's six of us and we're here in my Zoom room. And then 15 minutes later, they go and another group comes in and they just pass through my room all day, all morning long. Yeah. That's how we do it. And it, it used to be the conference room, you know, at our old office. And now it's, now it's on Zoom. Yeah. So what type of services um, can they provide? Yeah. Yeah. So let me get back to that. So linked VA now um, and, and the importance of LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is a business network. I started using it in 2008. Um, I don't think it had been around too long, a couple of years uh, when I started using it. And at the time, you know, I really didn't know what to think of it. I was making a career transition from one market to another. So I thought it was a good idea to create a profile. And at the time, there were like 100,000, uh, no, more than that, but probably a couple of million people on the platform. And I looked at it at that time as, as to my virtual resume. It's just my CV. This is who I am. This is where I studied. These are the jobs I've had. And that it was potentially a place that I could collaborate, look for other people in my field. More importantly, where people could find me and if they had questions or looking for my expertise or wanted to buy my products and services, it was a place to potentially do business. Today, 2024, there are over a billion people on LinkedIn. So that is literally one in seven, you know, human beings on the planet are, are on LinkedIn. And so 
the one thing that's so true though about LinkedIn when you compare it to all other social channels is it has remained pure to the idea that it is the place to do business first. You, there is some social aspects because you can direct message and you endorse and so on and so forth, but it really is business first. It's business first and yet um, the Pew a think tank out here in, in the US did a study a few months back or actually it was late last year. And they basically identified that only 3% of LinkedIn users are adept, that they're actually using it the way it was intended, the way it is designed to be used. So that means 97% of people, 29 out of 30 are basically, no LinkedIn is important, probably have a profile, but aren't really, they're not really doing anything with it. They're not getting outputs. It's not a predictable place for them to do business and don't have a full grasp of what the um, potential liabilities are if you're not uh, you know, paying attention to your LinkedIn profile. Mm -hmm. So I, st I studied that research. I went to a couple of really large trade shows and I had an epiphany because at the time I had LinkedIn automation software that we utilized internally and we had it assigned to all of our portfolio companies and LinkedIn had just been part of our SOP for all of our businesses to, to do business development and to create opportunities and connections. And so I took my internal SOP, what we do every day for our own businesses and turn that into a business and service that I can do for others. And so that's how linked VA now was birth. It, the idea was the general entrepreneur is too busy with their yeah. existing core business to spend the appropriate amount of time on their own LinkedIn profile nurturing and harvesting leads from their network. Yeah. And so my team with Linked VA now is able to do that for a very nominal fee. They're able to connect with your profile and basically work it on a daily basis so that you can focus only on the outputs, um, whether it's leads or connections or proposals or whatever, whatever the end game is for you. I'd love to sign up. <laughs> okay. So, well, one thing we are doing, Nicolette, um, for mm -hmm. your uh, viewers and listeners is uh, linkedvanow.com um, is offering a free profile audit. So the beginning of our process with someone like yourself would be to look at your LinkedIn profile objectively, and then based on eight different characteristics, give you our feedback. Mm -hmm. Then that feedback becomes the basis for some changes that you can make on your own or we can make together. We also, in addition to the audit, will deliver a fully articulated guide for how to improve your LinkedIn profile. And then we, we offer a consultation, of course, with one of our account managers so they can tell you more about the feedback you need and then tell you more about our service. Um, when you think about what one would invest into something like this, I mean, we charge $697 US per month for this service. And so if you think about that type of an investment, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to hire any type of assistant to do any meaningful work for you for, for that relatively small amount of money. So most agencies that do this kind of work charge three to $4,000 US per month. So we come in at a fraction of that. And the reason I'm able to do that is because I already have a team. My team was assembled to work for me and my projects, and it's infinitely scalable. And as we grow our customer base for Linked VA now, we just add and train more team members. Mm. Mm. And this works for any entrepreneurs, any any type of business that's that's yeah. looking to. Yeah, okay. you know, we we do a lot. We do business with a ton of coaches and okay. trainers. Oh, okay. We do a ton of business. <laughs> yeah, we do a ton of business with um, financial services professionals, insurance, all manner of sales teams. So it's funny, we even have some nonprofits who are looking to raise money for their oh. you know, dog. So that, so they, right. they did it successfully. We haven't had too many you know, in situations where a customer has come in and, and we've not delivered. At, there are some campaigns that you know, the customer is getting 30, 40 leads a week, very high volume. Others are a lot less than that. The more stringent, the more um, restrictive the target is, the audience is smaller. And so it takes longer to build a critical mass of leads. Like we have some customers in biotechnology. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for like very specific people who do a particular job title and 
nobody else. And so, you know, in that case, I know there's one customer where the entire, you know, the typical audience is going to be in the hundreds of thousands. And in this case, it's, it's like 577 people in the Western <laughs> US, you know? So it's going to take time to get to those specific targets. I always encourage the teams to, to tell our customers, broaden the audience yeah. so that you're getting into conversations. Try not to be too um, restrictive. And then, then you dial it in. Not mm -hmm. such a small target that it's almost impossible to hit and then try to broaden out. You know, start wide, come into focus, uh, because that there is where you're going to get you're going to get a process and a flow so that uh, our lead um, flow will complement whatever you're doing in terms of your pre-existing system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you also serve customers outside of U.S. or just oh, the yeah. U.S.? All over the world. Yeah. Well, I think we're on, we're on every continent except yeah. Antarctica. Maybe. Who knows? Wow. Yeah. Okay. We definitely need to. All scientists down there. <laughs> all nonprofit scientists. Yeah. yeah. I don't think we have a huge audience down there, but no, um, we're, we have customers in Asia, you know, Australia, Middle East, Europe, South America, North America, of course. Mm -hmm. So all over the world. Our team is, you know, in the pocket working U.S. time zone business hours. But the way our system is built is we have software that is running 24 seven. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be constant outputs and mm -hmm. then the team will get in at the beginning of their shifts and they will channel the outputs where they need to go. And then one of the features of our service is we create a weekly report that is you know, sent to each one of our customers. So they get a very clearly delineated accounting of what transpired during the week prior in terms of the activity on their LinkedIn profile and the number of qualified leads. Wow. Wow. Yes. We have to connect after the interview. <laughs> right. Yes. So, Charles, what was your journey in the space of venture capital? So we knew we had the successful exit to a private equity. And mm -hmm. at the time, we knew we wanted to create an environment for a handful of projects we were interested in invested in. And so we created a venture studio model. And what that is, is to say that we're not just check writers who write a check to invest in a startup, but we also participate in the uh, value creation in that startup. Mm -hmm. So my background, for example, is revenue generation sales. So I typically will get involved almost as like a fractional chief revenue officer, sales officer to advocate to the portfolio companies in our, in our venture studio, best processes for setting up their sales organization, sales teams. Studio. We have, when you say studio, ahead. it's like media to me. It's not, it's not it, related to media. Right? Studio is, well, when you think studio, you think creative, right? Creation. Yeah. Cre yeah. Creation. That's, that's what it is. It's creation, uh, creating the companies. Right. We're not just, you know, a venture, a typical venture capital firm mm. is a pile of money yeah, that is described out, and then some of the partners might sit on boards. Yeah, right. But that's it. There's typically mm -hmm. not a lot of actual work going on. Um, in our case, we not only, in like in my case, will help with sales organization. We also do engineering. We have mm -hmm. centralized customer support and service. So we are a lot of things to our portfolio companies, and and because we're working alongside our founders. That's the studio element of, of what we do. Wow. Wow. Okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. You are an important man. About <laughs> to be an important man <laughs> in, as I step into this, this next space. Yes. Okay. So what should a VC anticipate in terms of the upsides of investing in any sort of companies versus the risk that they should be ready to take, to take prior to investing in startups? Well, venture capital today... Or fundraising, like you know, nowadays you have crowd crowdfunding. Now mm. you have companies that don't have to go the traditional venture capital route. If they're like a founder trying to raise money, they can go to a platform like <clears throat> Republic or Start Engine, and they can just start raising money at a hundred dollars a pop from the investors. They don't have to go to pitch pitch you know, contests and roadshow and 
present to venture firms. They, it's, it's been fairly democratized in terms of if a founder wants to raise money, there are many avenues through which to do it. Now, that's on the fundraising founder looking to raise money side. If somebody in your audience is looking themselves to invest in companies, mm -hmm. I mean, I would just say that in startups, particularly in the technology sector, failure is abundant. It's everywhere. Most yeah. companies fail. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to invest in a startup, uh, it cannot be money that you are counting on. Right? Mm -hmm. High risk. Mm -hmm. It's very high risk. Now, there are stories of, you know, somebody invested $5,000 in their neighbor's startup, and then that startup got acquired by Microsoft, right? And that 5000 was worth, you know, a million dollars. And that ha I, I, that has happened. I know people that that, that that very scenario has it's happened to them, where they get a hundred x return on their investment. But those are one hundred percent the exceptions and not the. So my general advice to people interested in exploring investing in startups: invest in companies, technology that are within industries you know, mm. right? You have yeah. some like sort of common DNA with, mm. because if you don't know anything about agri-tech. F&B. You know, I'm just saying like <laughs> agri-tech, agricultural technology, Right, right. Like, then you probably shouldn't invest in that company. Not at mm. its startup stage. If it's a NASDAQ or you know, stock exchange traded company, you, you know, there's all sorts of protections and regulations that exist yeah. at that level. But if you're looking to get involved in an early stage startup, it should really be in, in a field you have some familiarity with. And if not that, then you certainly have a familiarity and knowledge of the founders. You know, mm. they're people whose character you can attest to. You know, getting involved with strangers in industries you know nothing about, that's a very it's a very risky proposition. Because you have no lens, you have no insight into are things going well or are things going poorly. So I, I generally wouldn't wouldn't advocate, you know, uh, that average folks take those kinds of risks. If you've heard all that and you still want to invest, then I would recommend that you check out. There's two um, platforms in particular. I mentioned them earlier. One is called Start Engine, and the other is called Republic. They're both, you know, North America based, but I do think that there's global access in terms of investing. Mm -hmm. And what these are 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 crowdfunding. So they raise from investors that are typically putting $100, $200, $500, relatively small amounts mm -hmm. uh, into the into the projects. I mean, there's another platform you've probably heard of called Kickstarter. Yeah. This is more common for like a physical product. Like I created the ultimate stress ball, uh -huh. right? So I put it on <laughs> Kickstarter and pre-sell my inventory and I fundraise that way. So it's sort of like Kickstarter, again, intangible. You're just buying, you know, a piece of stock in the company for the hopes that at a later date, there's an exit and it's worth something. And, um, wow. you know, this is, this is a, this is That's a simpler, possible. less ri risky way for everyday folks to get involved with, um, venture to get involved yeah. with startup investing. Because the first thing that comes to mind when it comes to VC, it's like you have, you need to have an X amount of money and yes. then most people get that's the first thing. And then when they see that, they back away, they back off. And it's like, this is not for me. I'm going to stick to my nine to five and just be ordinary. Although some of them might have that, you know, I don't know, they have this vision that I want to be a part of something, but I just don't know how to start. And everywhere I look, people are not doing it. Mm. Well, I hope from, from this conversation, mm -hmm. some of them might, you know, reach out and start, start going after whatever it is that they, they want, their dreams. <laughs> At least this is what I do, what I do. <laughs> what is next for you, Charles? Uh, I'm very focused on our current portfolio. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're not really taking on new ventures. Uh, I don't think for the balance of the calendar year, we're very focused on, on scaling our existing projects. And um, as far as acquisitions and exits, I mean, that's constantly happening in the background. So, wow. um, you know, <laughs> for your, is, for your businesses or yeah, for, for so, your clients. So, so it, 
every single day I'm in due diligence, either selling oh. a company or buying a company. So part no. chunk of my day is staring at somebody else's spreadsheets or explaining financial somebody. <laughs> yeah. And, and so a lot of data rooms and things like that. So that's a constant presence in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, my experience with exits and acquisitions is that most deals don't happen. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're in, in the middle of it, you've put months into it and then the deal dies, you know, for whatever reason, typically there's just a angle to the business that the buyers are not comfortable with or sellers sometimes change the terms, you know, midstream. And uh, that happens often, especially if they have, you know, successful, t you know, you're, you could be in like, you could have like a signed letter of intent to acquire a company for X, but they just had a record quarter, <laughs> mm. you know, we don't, now we don't want to sell it for that. We want to sell it for more, you know, and yeah. you may not be willing to pay that more. Mm -hmm. That also happens. So um, that's always happening. But um, Linked VA now is a, is a major initiative. You said earlier we launched it in 2022. That's not quite accurate. It was actually October okay. 23. Ah, that, we, okay. that we launched it. Now the technology, right. the underlying technology that runs it was a, a software only platform that we ran for three years. Mm. Link VA now is just the iteration that has the full service model. So right. Tech's right. been around for almost five years, but this iteration has been around. Uh, I the think team was right. fully set up in twenty in in twenty twenty three. Right, that's what the, you mean. Well, where 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 our internal team is is like uh, you know available to be hired right for ah, for right. customers. Okay. Because prior to that, it was just an internal system and an internal team. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Thank you. So I just want to bring that that thing that you mentioned just earlier, a few seconds ago on the part where you spend most of your day, 80%, if not, um, I don't know, what's the percentage looking at financial statements, nays, due diligence, work, and then not all of them, at least a, a percentage does not get, you know, doesn't get true. How do you stay motivated to continue doing what you do. Mm. And, and and this is pivoting to my self-worth question because, you know, my podcast talks a lot about self-worth. And funny enough, the question that I have for you right now, it's about imposter syndrome. So mm -hmm. this is fitting very perfectly. So the question for you, Charles, imposter syndrome is a common challenge that affects people in various fields. So if you can, you know, pivot it back to your case. So how can one overcome IS and recognize their true value and capabilities? I think IS happens when the person in question is finding themselves in a position where they have to improvise a lot. You, know, you don't have the mm, answer. Yeah. So rather yeah. Than, so rather, the resilience. Yeah, the so change your, change your, you know, your setup. Um, somebody hits you with a question that you truly don't know the answer, respectfully say that not yeah. talk around it and try to figure out, you know, clever ways to still look smart and, mm -hmm. um, you know, be authentic. That's, that's the key motivating factor. It's so, sort of like in my situation, you know, I built this great new company that's, you know, growing gangbusters uh, and, and cash flowing and all that good stuff, but it's, it's not by accident. It was an internal system I had already built for myself. So it was like a very selfish thing. So when I talk to people about how important this product with Link VA now is, it's not hard to be authentic because I've been living it for years and years and years. So it's it's who I am. Preach. So, yeah, you <laughs> yes. know, it's it, it's my authentic self. It's not some concoction creation that I just made. You have for to put a mask on this morning. Okay, today yeah. I'm gonna I'm yeah. gonna be this. Just and, to sell it. People feel like imposters when they don't have they don't have the answers, and they're afraid to say they don't have the answer. That, that's that's the key, I think, mental position they find themselves, and then they're reaching, right? They're reaching. I gotta I gotta say something smart here, and then they're afraid to look vulnerable. That's that's where it becomes an issue. Oh, I, wow, wow, wow! I love that. I love that. I stand by that, truly and really, because. My number one mantra is to be yourself, be authentic because there's, you're one of one, right? You're not one in a million. You're one of one. Thank you, Charles. So what is your heart's greatest wish? 
I want, I've always wanted to create generational wealth for my family because, you know, I came from, you know, a good background, but, you know, not a ton of means. And, you know, I went to public schools and, you know, so one of the first things I was able to do for my oldest child is, you know, send her to a private education. Wow. And uh, she, she's actually about to graduate from college in two weeks. Oh, so, congratulations. Yeah, big deal. And so creating deal. opportunities for my family, that that's number one, 100%. Mm -hmm. Now, beyond my own four walls, I truly want to positively affect the entrepreneurial experience for you know, individual entrepreneurs, because it can be a very lonely existence. And so, yes. so much of what I do between my work in the restaurant industry, small business, retail, um, what we're doing with LinkedIn, all of it centers around entrepreneurs, small business, because we want to be advocates. And so if I can help an entrepreneur normalize their business situation, take a vacation with their family yeah. from their business, that's what I want to do. Exactly, because that's that's the very thing that got you into business because you want more time with your family or do other things that you want to do. Sure. Yeah. 100%. Wow. Wow. Okay. Again, you are a, an important man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you have a mantra that you live by? The best is yet to come. You the know what that is does to... is it doesn't allow you to be satisfied with where you are today, no matter how much you've achieved. And you always have something to look forward to. If the best is yet to come, then I don't even know, you know, how good can it get? <laughs> wow. Yes. Thank mm. you. <laughs> mm. What keeps you up at night? Is there anything that keeps you up at night or do you sleep well? No, I, I sleep pretty well. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I've got a portfolio of companies and I would be lying to you if I said they were always doing amazing. I mean, mm. it seems no matter how hard I work, try, plan, <laughs> they're not all firing on all cylinders, you know. Like yeah. one is great, the other one, oh, what happened over here? You know, and, and so that stuff keeps me awake at night. And, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of craziness in the world. Um, you know, uh, the geopolitical areas that are unstable. I mean, I'm, I'm very concerned about those sorts of things because, you know, we are one humanity. We're all connected. And so it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the planet. It's going to, it's going to affect what's happening in, in your backyard. And so I think those things keep me awake, you know, to a certain degree. And just, you know, just the, as I said earlier, you know, as I, I, I work pretty hard, I try to work smart and not all days are created equal. Some days I feel a great sense of accomplishment. Other days I, I go down on my computer and then I look up and it's, oh, it's already the evening. And I'm wondering to myself, what did I actually get done today? That have, mm. I have days like that. Mm. So those, those, that can make for some restless nights. Well, thank you for being honest and vulnerable. Really appreciate that. Okay, Charles, if you could create a quote right now for you to leave to the audience listening and the world as your legacy, what would it be? Quote, uh, let's see. Well, I did, I had a pretty good one there, right? The best is Yeah, yet. that was good. That well, was that, good. That's pretty good. Because that truly is my every day. Because it just keeps me striving, wanting to do more, wanting to be better. Uh, and it's a good mantra when you're raising a family, right? Mm -hmm. That way the kids are never satisfied. You know, they, maybe they ran a very fast race, but they can mm -hmm. be faster. Yeah. So I, I really do believe that's, that I, there are some other ones bouncing around in my head, you know, that, I, that are, are important to me, but that is probably chief among them. Mm -hmm. the and best something is I would want to everybody come. to know and, and be able to, meditate on mm -hmm. the best is yet to come so how can people reach out to you charles yeah well as, as one might expect i'm pretty easy to find on linkedin mm -hmm. my parent company our venture studio is berelentless.com the company as my shirt says relentless yeah i love the bull yeah <laughs> that logo i love it you won't stop the, um, yeah you won't stop <laughs> berelentless.com and then uh, if they're interested in the linkedin side of things I'm sure you'll share the link, but linkedvanow.com is a good place for just about any professional to get an honest, some honest feedback about their profile and how mm -hmm. it is, um, you know, how it is faring compared to the market and get some uh, objective feedback. All right. Awesome. So thank you so much, Charles. And there you have it, guys. You heard mm -hmm. it from the person himself, Charles. Mm -hmm. Correct, sir. <laughs> yes. Before we close off, 
I'd like to thank you, Charles, personally for the work that you're doing for the world and for advancing every step of the way despite the challenges, creating trails for those that will come after you. This has been that one podcast with that one controversial name, You're Wordless. Read that again. The juxtaposition of your very soul. If you find yourself thinking that you're wordless, you're not alone. But more importantly, ask yourself level deeper. If I'm wordless, then why the heck am I here? It is because you have, your soul has chosen to be here energetically, all the way from the ethers. And for that reason itself, you are worthy and you are enough. This has been Charles Currencer, guest of the day, and Nick Nieras, your host, signing off. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>